Welcome to a, another very special edition of Pastor's Corner. We are indeed very happy to have you today and that you would have shared your time with us, even as we have joined together to examine yet another very interesting subject matter, one, I think, that is quite relevant even to us, even as we are continuing to, uh, to go through and even we have seen the effect of the current pandemic and how we react as Christians to those things, even in our own, in the social aspect of it, and also in the spiritual aspect of it, that I promise you that today's uh, subject and, of course, the program today will be truly uh, beneficial and, of course, educational uh, in relating to the subject that is before us. And so welcome, and may God bless you even as you are sitting in with us today. Again, remember to like, to share the program, to invite your friends, uh, invite family members to be a part of our gathering here at Pastor's Corner. And I pray, even as I have said before, that God will bless us richly even as we continue for the rest of the program. So at this time, I just want you, even before we go any further, to bow your head as we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done, the blessing of the new day. But even as we lift the present program before you, Pastor's Corner, be with our listeners and bless them now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And so today, we are happy. And again, I said, it's a very interesting topic and one that will engender in us, of course, we are looking forward to your responses. We are looking forward to hear from you. Um, all those who already tuned in, uh, we have uh, Sister Veronica is already there. Um, happy to have you. All the rest, near and far, uh, may God bless us as we continue. So the subject for today, um, the laws of the land versus the laws of God. So I'll repeat that. The laws of the land versus the laws of God. So, of course, there are many who have questions, um, many questions even as related to the COVID-19 pandemic, as it relates to how do the Christians should react to, you know, very various protocols that have been put in place, uh, various aspects of, you know, like the emergency uh, 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 orders that have been placed across, not only in Grenada, but even throughout, throughout the world, and how we react in situations like these as Christian. So, again, the topic for today, the laws of the land, versus the laws of God. Now, additionally, today I have uh, two panelists with me. Of course, they are quite versed and, and, and properly are prepared to deal with the discussion at hand today. Uh, firstly, I'll introduce the panelists to my left. We have Pastor Jerome Gordon. Uh, of course, he's a senior pastor in the Southern District here in the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, a learned man, and one who is, as I said before, properly prepared to deal with this very important subject matter. So I'll allow Pastor Gordon to say hello to you. Well, it is our profoundest delight to have you sharing these moments with us as we discuss a topical issue, one that is absolutely relevant to our day and time. Nice to have you stay with us until the program completes. All right, thank you so much, Pastor Gordon. And of course, to my right, we have Pastor Kimi Palmer. Of course, he's a pastor there in the Northeastern District. And again, we're very happy to have him. And of course, that he will share, even in his expertise and knowledge, as it relates to the subject. So, Pastor uh, Palmer, would you say hello to our listeners? Thank you. Uh, to everyone online and who's listening and hearing, I pray God blessing upon you. And as we proceed um, discussion, this discussion, I pray it will be a blessing to all of us. All right. So, thank you so much. We have Brother Desmond Lambert. Uh, all the way, Ocho Rios, Jamaica, joining us. Uh, good morning to you, and thanks for being a part of Pastor's Corner uh, this morning. So at this time, we're going to have a pro promotional video. Uh, so we're going to look and, of course, enjoy the promotion.
All right, welcome back to Pastor's Corner. All right, welcome back to Pastor's Corner. All right, well, uh, we are very thankful for all those who are, of course, the greetings. We have Sister Paris, a pleasant good morning to you. Um, you know, nice to have you on. Um, we thank you. Um, we have Sister Langain and, and, of course, we have Isaac who have indicated. Of course, we have the audio now up and ready to go. And so thanks for joining us. And may God bless us even as I said, we discuss um, this all-important subject matter, the laws of the law of the land, sorry, versus the law of God. So let's begin um, this morning. First question to our panelists. What are the essential differences between the law of the land and the laws of God? What are the essential differences between the laws of the land and the laws of God? So Pastor Gordon will lead out. Laws are for governance. And God has his kingdom. God has his sphere of influence. He has his government. And so God gives us his laws. And his word is communicated to us through his prophets. So we know what his requirements are. And we are enjoined to obey God's requirements, his laws. And all his laws are for our benefit. God's laws are supposed to transform us, or ameliorate our conditions that we can live better lives down here. Human laws are usually enacted in a legislature and um, they are for governance, for shaping a nation along a certain pathway, creating a certain legislative framework for public order, public, public health, and for the collection of taxes and for the running of a country. So I could say there is an element of commonality between God's laws and human laws in that they both, generally speaking, are intended for the good of the persons, the subjects over whom or over which um, there is uh, um, authority. All right, thank you so much. And of course, I think the, the key takeaway here is that law itself is intended for good. So whether it's from God or from, from the government or from man in that, in that instance, some, the main aim, the main uh, a drive of most of the laws are really for good. And so, Pastor Palmer, mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to that, that same question, the essential differences, uh, what is your take on that, on, on that question? To add to it, um, the law of God and the law of man. The law of, of, of God... I just want to add to it. It speaks in terms of, you know, that, that's God's divine law. It's, it's divine. It's, it's, un, it's immutable. It's unchanging principles. When you think about the, about the law of God, we're thinking about unchanging principles. Um, and also, you know, God's law is eternal. You know, it's, it's, it's eternal. Also, um, the law of God, it is, it is superior. And then, Man's law exists in trying to bring convenience to our society. That's you know, but then God's law also have a you know it have a, a sort of a higher um, meaning to it. Um, speaking about um, the law come from pure love, you know, for us. God's law came from love for us. So it it it, it transcending, you know, it, it goes just you know just beyond trying to yes, of course, as was said. Um, all laws, you know, it's for order, it's for convenience, you know. But then it goes beyond and speaks about the love of God, that's what he has for us. All right, thank you so much. And of course, uh, pleasant good morning, uh, Sister Barbara, uh, Sister Cynthia, um, happy to have you on. Um, we have uh, Sister Brenda online also. Uh, welcome, uh, nice to have you. And of course, Sister Stacy, who is also um, saying good morning. Um, so happy to have everyone uh, listening here today, but again, we are asking you if you have any questions, maybe even comments. That even as we continue and the discussion today, that feel free to put it in the chat. You could ask your questions, or even if you have a comment to make, feel free to also reply in the chat and um, with your comment. Um, so now we get into the gist of it. Having established um, in terms of the law of God um, versus the law of man, we get into the gist of the discussion that I think will really help us in clarifying a number of issues or a number of questions that you may have. So if someone is aware, unaware, question, of a command given by God, is he exempted from punishment 
on account of this ignorance. So if somebody doesn't know, would they be exempted from punishment? Question um, today. Uh, that's a, a very interesting question. And um, we, we need to pay careful attention to this because on the human side, it is often said ignorance to the law does not um, obviate obedience to the law on the, on the human um, plane. So you can't say, for example, I, I did not know that I was to drive at uh, 30 miles an hour on the highway. You're coming down the highway, charging your, your, um, your beautiful RAV4, <laughs> troubling my pastor, and you're, you're driving at 100 miles an hour, and the cops stop you. You can't say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know what the speed limit was. You know, they, 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 they are expected to know um, if you're going to be using a, a motor vehicle in a particular context, you are expected to know, and you cannot plead ignorance. The, the cop may exercise discretion and not give you a ticket, but, but on the human level, ignorance to the law will not excuse you, will not obviate your penalty. When it comes down to God's law, we have an interesting scenario with um, Paul preaching at Mars Hill, as is recorded in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. And um, Paul actually, in his discourse, says that at the time of ignorance, God winks at you. Um, but now commands ye every, every man every way to repent. What is he saying? That where God is concerned, when you did not know of his particular requirement, he will not charge you for it. Now, that does not mean that you will not suffer the consequences. For example, if you never knew that, uh, let's say, eating a high cholesterol meat like pork was wrong, and pork is, uh, is, is replete, it's, 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 a, it's a meat pound for pound, pork has perhaps the highest um, amount of cholesterol in comparison to beef or chicken or some other uh, meat. Now, if you never knew that that was wrong and you've been consuming a lot, it does not mean that you would not have arteries that are clogged with cholesterol. There are natural consequences to doing wrong, even though God may not charge you in a, in a juridical or a judicial sense. God will not, you know, put a charge against your name for it because you did not know. But the fact is that every act of disobedience, whether knowingly or unknowingly, has some natural inexorable consequences that follow. All right, wonderful. And I think, you know, that, that brings to mind, you know, even as we have um, responding also steadily in Isaac, when I look at the law of the land, I see the law of the land uh, was taken from the Ten commands, uh, Commandments that show how important the Ten Commandments are to man. And again, Pastor Gordon, even as you have responded, you know, I think it also lends itself nicely um, to that idea, you know, so that at the end of the day, when you talk about ignorance, uh, persons are sometimes willfully ignorant, as we say. So you have church, they will not attend church. You have uh, evangelistic meetings, they will not draw by, they will pass street, uh, magazines and other tracts are given out, and they'll refuse it. So that, that's willful ignorance. They, they have the opportunity to know, and yet they rejected it. So that form of ignorance itself is not genuine ignorance. And so again, we have to be careful in understanding that even if you're ignorant in that sense, if you want to be generous, that as Pastor Gordon said, you are not excused because you ought to know. And so Pastor Palmer, uh, as it relates to that, what do you, what do you think on, uh, uh, in terms of the command given by God, is somebody ignorant of it, uh, would they be exempted from punishment on account of that ignorance? Well, I think it was well you know, said and explained, but you know, in terms of the key word that might trouble us is ignorant. You know, and then you mentioned it nicely um, in terms of genuine and willful ignorance. And of course, you know, the, uh, the idea of, of there always be um, 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 consequence um, it may not be like in terms of um, the punishment, as was said, in terms of health. You know, you, you, you might be in, va in violation. You, do, you don't know maybe what you eat or what you drink, and it affects you. Um, you know, but the Bible goes on in the same text, you know, like chapter 17 and verse 30. 
And it says, truly, the times of ignorance God overlook, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And the, the end of the text, you know, is yes, yeah, it's there by ignorance, but eventually everyone will come to knowledge and they'll know, and then the call is to, to repent. Um, there's a, a, a text, um, Psalms chapter 50 and verse 21. Um, sometimes we believe that because, you know, God is you know, silent and nothing happening, he is okay with, with, um, with it. Um, Acts chapter 20, um, 50 and verse 21 says, well, 20 and 21, um, it says here, um, you sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. So God is saying that here that um, nothing is really already done by ignorance. You know, there will always be some level um, of consequence that will really follow it. So I think that we have it well. God is long-suffering, but eventually there will be consequences. All right, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Pastor Gordon? Yeah, in addition to that, um, Pastor Palmer, I agree with you so much. I would like to speak to the question of ignorance a little more because there are those persons who have what I may choose to call blissful ignorance. I recall um, during Operation Desert Shield when um, President George Bush wanted to expel the Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Maybe, Pastor, you're probably too young to, rem to remember that. <laughs> but I remember some, I was at university and somebody said to me, Pastor um, Jerome, I wasn't the pastor yet, could you, my husband wants to know about the prophecies because with all these things happening on the geopolitical stage of action, he believes that there are some prophetic implications. I said, sure, I'll go. But the next day, Pastor Panchu, the lady came and said, my husband said, you're not to come. I said, why? He said, if he doesn't know all of these things, then God cannot hold him responsible for anything. So, and I, I, I had news for him. Not only will you be held responsible for what you know, but for what you could have known had you taken the time to know it. So don't hide behind the curtain of ignorance when it is willful and deliberate ignorance. You are still chargeable in the sight of God. All right. Thank you so much. And I think that leads well into um, the, the comment by uh, Brother Desmond, which says, for me, I would say that we should obey the laws of the land once they are in line with, the, with, with God's laws. And so now that we understand clearly that when we talk about ignorance, um, you know, God knows and sees everything. And so nobody could excuse themselves by saying, I don't know, when God has placed all the avenues before them whereby knowledge is available to them. And I think the example that used Pastor Gordon is quite, quite appropriate. You know, so that we all, all mankind have been exposed in one way or the other to the laws of God. And that um, revelation of itself means that we all have to give account even for the blessing that God has given us, even through um, his knowledge, whether it's the written word or the created word. Now, the third, the third question for today, and again, as I said, um, it was already led on to, um, are Christians required to obey the laws of the land in, even if they may be in contravention to the law of God? Are Christians required to obey the laws of the land even if they are in contravention to the law of God? Pastor Palmer? Well, God law, as we explain, it is supreme. And, and on, along that light, that man's law was established trying to harmonize and to, you know, to create some level of order. But what we have to keep in mind, that the law of God is supreme. And whenever we reach a point where it, where it begins to contradict or to contravene or to, or to go um, in disharmony, not in harmony with the word of God, then um, it's not practical in terms of obeying we, will discuss, we are discussing it in terms of obeying um, the law of the, of, um, of the land. So we have to be careful of that and always keep in mind that what we're following here is the divine law. And when there is point of disobeying, then there could be other um, rep, um, rep, rep, repercussions. But we have to keep in mind that the law of, the, of God takes precedence over the law of the land. And once it's not in harmony with the, with the law of God. I can give other examples, but 
I'm just giving that as we start off the process um, in terms of obeying the law of the land and the law of God. All right, thank you so much, Pastor Gordon. Um, and again, I'm just going to tack on a little on that for you. Um, because as Pastor Palmer already explained that we should always obey the law of God um, over the law of the land. But we have so much of examples that we could tap into, especially as it relates to the COVID and um, the pandemic, current pandemic and otherwise. And I know that you already exhausted the subject on previous programs, even as it relates to labor laws and all of those things. So again, asking that question to you, I'm just tacking on those little aspects of it. You know, um, are Christians required to obey the laws of the land, even if they are in contravention to the law of God? I want to kind of disaggregate the two concepts and look at the first part. The first one, are Christians obligated to obey the laws of the land? Should Christians seek to know the laws of the land and obey them? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Christians must be the most law-abiding of all the, the people groups living in any particular location, any particular country. As Christians, we must be known by the state as a bunch of people that upholds the law, a bunch of people that promote the law, and especially Seventh-day Adventist Christians, because we preach obedience to the law of God. So we have to be unequivocal. We have to be clear. We have to disambiguate the issue. Yes, it's a resounding yes, we should obey the laws of the land. Now, the second concept um, is what happens when the law of the land is in direct contravention of the law of the Lord? Now, here, the Christian has to understand the question of identity. Who are we? And the truth is that we are first and foremost citizens of heaven, and then secondarily, in a secondary sense, we are citizens of the country in which we reside, the country whose passports we hold. So we give allegiance first to God. So when the laws of the land contravene the laws of God, we have no option but to um, obey God first. Now, there are two ways, uh, Mr. Moderator, that we could do this. We could create a movement like Barnabas was. The, 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 um, the gospel writer Mark tells us that Barnabas was in insurrection, in revolt against Rome. Should Christians get involved in adversarial movements, movements that are inimical to the legislature in the country and whatever rolls off the press of the legislature, we oppose it. No. While you may not be in agreement, you are not called to be adversarial and to be known as zealots and, and Christian fanatics and you're always against the law. You could decide in your own way that you're not going to follow it. For example, there are in certain jurisdictions a law that says that as a marriage officer, you are required to marry two people. Now, Pastor Pancho, in certain jurisdictions, two people might not be the same as what you would biblically endorse. In such a case that, that you have the right not to go against your conscience to follow, even though the law says it, you don't have to follow it. So... Um, no, you don't have to follow all that the law says because we have a conscience that ought to remain true to God. And the final part of your question as it relates to the COVID-19 regulations. Now, I smile at this one because I've heard some people saying, Pastor, why should we ch um, close the doors of the church? After all, we are God's people. These are secular men. We are spiritual people. We ought to obey God and open the, the church doors, even though the authorities say that the doors should be closed. Well, I am sorry. I need to point out that when there is a pandemic, when there are issues that deal with public health and public safety, national security, there are certain emergency powers that may be exercised by the government. And even though it may um, be, to some extent, inimical to your regular religious routines, it is in the interest of the nation that we comply. All right. Wonderfully said. 
Um, I'm looking at um, Sister Brendan Well saying, as Christian and children, we should all obey the laws of God. After all, we are humans, and all have sins and come short of the glory of God. But we have to obey the law. Um, Sister Isaac says, um, well-spoken men, and um, Sister um, Stedlin Isaac, I don't think God will hold us guiltless if we refuse to know the truth from error. Most persons got opportunities to know and refuse to accept. And of course, Alicia Stevens says, obey the law in the Lord. And so, of course, we thank you so much for your responses. And I think even as our panelists would have, would have shared with us, it is always important um, to put God first. And sometimes a lot of the scenarios that we are confronted daily, um, where our Christianity is called to light, uh, even in the terms of our, our Seventh-day Adventism, um, in terms of our practices, that some persons sometimes they get carried away in thinking that the church is somehow compromising um, when they give um, obedience to the, land of the, um, the law of the land. But of course, as it says, as long as those laws does not contravene the biblical principles and laws set out by God, then it is okay to obey. The only time it's okay to disobey is if there is a contravention. And so even as we go further in the discussion, then we'll get more to the, when it is okay to disobey. But of course, we thank our panelists so far um, for the excellent responses um, to the question. So before we take a break, we're going to take one final question. Should disabled dis disobedience ever be acceptable or appropriate for Christians? Now, let the, I'm going to let that one marinate a little bit with you. Should civil disobedience ever be acceptable or appropriate for a Christian? And so we're going to piggyback a little bit on Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Um, Pastor Palmer, if you could assist us in the reading of Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Um, again, Daniel was in a very specific situation. Um, the law of the land was passed um, as it relates to him praying. And of course, he was restricted from praying. But you know, Daniel still ignored the commands of the land, sure. the law of the land. And he opened up his window. And as his custom was, he prayed to his God. And so was Daniel being presumptuous? Was he being unchristian? And of course, we're going to piggyback on that in answering the question, is civil disobedience ever acceptable or appropriate for the Christian? So Pastor Palmer will assist us in reading Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. The word of God declares, Daniel 6 and verse 10. And just to give you some little back, backdrop, that was speaking about Daniel in the lands then, that whole story there. But the text says, verse 10, Daniel 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. All right, thank you so much. So the question, is it ever okay to disobey the law of the land? Pastor well, we were, we were, the question also is in light of um, the point of um, civil disobedience. Yes. I think um, should civil disobedience be acceptable, you know, or appropriate for a Christian? Well, civil disobedience um, speaks, just to give some little insight, in terms of refusal to comply with certain laws, right, in terms of the, laws, the law of the land. And there are many ways that that can be done. Um, you, can, you can be passive, you can be active, you can have um, 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 public and peaceful showing of disagreement um, in terms of civil disobedience. So it also speaks about, um, um, it, well, of course, in terms of the law, it could be illegal, but nonviolent um, action um, done for moral reasons. So nonviolent action done in terms of uh, moral um, re reasons. We know that um, history has given us some examples of civil disobedience um, where persons um, conscious, they, you know, they find that what is being done um, should not be done. And they, they stood up, they had some nonviolent or, or passive approach to it. For instance, um, um, we know about um, the Rosa Park, uh, Parks issue um, on the bus and how she refused to, 
to give up a seat in terms of the racial aspect, um, the black and white um, scenario. Um, Gandhi in India, we know about Martin Luther King, how they all um, went through that process of civil um, disobedience. Um, we can pull um, from, the, from the word of God to um, other examples. But we just read in terms of Daniel um, opening up his, open up the windows. Um, some might consider, some consider it an act of civil disobedience. Yes, um, they you know like certain decree passed, certain, you know, but Daniel, as his custom was, he, he, he praying, praying to God. No law shall be passed to affect our worship with the, with the creator. And so Daniel decided, hello, I will continue along that path. Um, we know that um, the true Hebrew boys um, decided, I mean, I mean, when the decree passed, in terms of, you know, bow down and, and worship, they stood up. You know, it, it's, it's a level of civil disobedience um, in terms of what the state at the time, you know, passed. But they stood up and they decided, hello, I'm bowing, I, I mean, I, I'm bending. So th they wasn't violent, they wasn't, you know, but they stood up. And, and, and of course, that reinforced for us the idea that when something comes into contravention, it contravenes the law of God, um, then we have to take a stand for it. The Hebrew boys, the three Hebrew boys, even at Daniel, and Daniel took a stand for it. All right, thank you so, so much, Pastor Palmer. Um, Pastor Gordon? Yes, and there, there are times, too, when one has to question the legitimacy of a government. Um, an illegitimate government that passes laws that are contrary to human rights, are contrary to to the Christian faith or a man's obedience to God, a man's allegiance to God. Um, in a case like that, one has to um, do acts that could be described, that are construed as acts of civil disobedience. There are many countries, for example, that have national heroes. And these national heroes, um, they were freedom fighters. They fought against hostile colonial powers in order to um, free the slaves, free the people. And later on, the nations have come to, to honor these people with lots of accolades and, and the pronouncements. These folks, they have been immortalized in the annals of history. But they were criminals because the illegitimate colonial government at the time say that they were covered, and I think of like in Sam Sharp, and there, there are several people who were called um, criminals because they rebelled against the government, but that which they stood for, you know, Mugabe, for example, I mean, he later on did crazy things, but if you look at his, his early history, he was a freedom fighter, and there are several people like that. So what is the point? The point is, if the government becomes tyrannical and enact laws that are inimical to the Christian faith, then if the Christian shows its disobedience to the government as an act of compliance to the commandments of God, then yes, the Christian would be um, in civil disobedience, but from the standpoint of God, the person, the Christian would be exonerated. All right. And again, that's an important distinction that we ought to make. So in the eyes of man, the person, of course, will appear to be um, disobedient. But in the eyes of God, they are obedient because they choose to obey God rather than man. Of course, um, some of you have been responding. So I'll just take a, a couple of the responses. Um, we have Desmond Lambert. Um, he says, yes, civil disobedience is okay as a Christian when the law of the land goes against the law of God. Um, we have... Um, Dorina, Daniel was not disobedient. He was doing what he did every day. And um, Sister um, Paris says, obey the law of the land once it does not get in the way of the law of God. Um, wonderful. And so at this time, we're going to take a break, uh, have a special item of music, and then we're going to come back with the second part of the program today.
Welcome back to Pastor's Corner, a wonderful item of special music. Uh, we do appreciate it greatly. Um, again, we, as we have been discussing thus far, considering the law of God versus the law of man, um, a lot of uh, aspect of it, a great aspect, have already been covered. Um, there is one um, comment, a question that was asked, and I want to promise um, that, that viewer that the question will be um, answered in depth at another opportunity as it relates to um, the divorce um, amongst the church. Uh, as again, it's not, uh, not only specifically to the church, but even to a wider community um, of the high rates of divorce and whether God is pleased or displeased. So I could only give maybe a short answer. Um, God hates divorce, um, but again, we are living in a time when we are seeing the enemy comes in so many forms. Um, one of the things I'm always mindful of is that the two institutions that survived Eden, the Sabbath and marriage, um, we have seen the enemy, how angry he has been towards um, the law of God as it relates to the Sabbath. Um, also, we have seen his anger directed at the family as it relates to marriages. So we just have to keep praying, keep trusting God, keep searching his word for strength. But I promise you that even on a later program, um, that subject matter will be um, discussed even at a greater length. And so again, welcome back. Continue to like and to share the program. Invite your friends to join in our discussion today. And so we are in the second part of the program. And so again, you know, any questions you have, you can please sit any comments um, in the chat. So we want to read from the book of Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 verse 1 to 5. Romans 13 verse 1 to 5. And we're going to invite Pastor Palmer to have the reading for us. I read from you from the word of God. Romans 13 verses 1 to 5. And the word of God begins, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto higher powers. For there is no power but of God. For um, the powers that be um, ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinances of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to do evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou, if, um, thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Last verse, verse 5. Wherefore, he must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. All right. Amen. And of course, that passage of scripture, Romans chapter 13, 1 to 5, Again, it relates to what we have discussed previously, even as it relates to civil disobedience, and of course, whether it's all is, is appropriate or acceptable for the Christian. So, Pastor Gordon, in light of that particular passage of Scripture, Romans 13, 1 to 5, uh, again, we have answered it already, but in terms of, you know, just expounding it a little bit more, um, how does that relate to the Christian as it relates to um, civil disobedience? When is it appropriate? And, and as such, is it ever appropriate for the Christian? according to Romans 13. I'm very happy that you have um, raised that particular text because that text has been abused, overused and abused to the point where it has been used as a justification for some of the most alarmingly oppressive acts by government. And some governments have said, you Christians, you need to fall in line because the, your scriptures say that you must obey the governments. But, you know, we are to be intelligent about this whole thing. Yes, we ought to have high regard for government, and I want to say how proud I am that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a church that has the greater res greatest of respect for government. And um, I have been to countries where there, there are restricted freedoms, and um, I was allowed to do certain things as a Seventh-day Adventist minister. I remember when, when the Soviet Union crumbled, um, some churches were not allowed to go in, but the Seventh-day Adventist church was one of the churches that got the green light. We had guys like Carter and Mark Finley. They went in. They had crusades in the very Kremlin because KGB, KGB files would have shown that the Seventh-day Adventist church traditionally 
is a church that promotes compliance with the government and respect for rulers and people in authority. So I, am, I, I want to accentuate that and affirm my church for its stance. Now, Paul, when he wrote, the government of the day was evil, oh boy. During the time of Paul, there was a guy sitting on the throne named Nero. And Pastor Pancho, you don't have to ask about the character of Nero. History is replete with the atrocities that Nero um, committed. Yet Paul said we must have respect for the government. So we must respect this passage, but don't overuse it because verse 4, now if you look at chapter 13, 4, Paul says the state is a minister of good unto you. They are there to carry out the will of God for good and not for evil. Therefore, if you are an evildoer, you should be afraid of the authorities. But the, the honest truth is there are times when the state is not the agent for good, when it does some very oppressive and things and some human rights violation. Under those so circumstances, the Christian has to take an intelligent approach because you cannot have what, what some philosophers call radical patriotism where you are patriotic even to the point where you condone and support governmental violation of human rights. You can do that, but you must, have, you must be persuaded that you need to speak out when things are, are not going in line with the word of God. As somebody said, um, radical patriotism, when an evil government is doing evil things, is not patriotic. Patriotism, it's, 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 it's to be idiotic. So, yes, Pastor Panchu, we obey the government, but there are times when you have to say this far and no further. Beyond this, I have to stand in support of human rights. I have to stand in support of biblical principles because the state is to be a minister of good and not evil. Amen. Wonderful. Uh, Pastor Palmer, you want to add? Well, to say that, um, the text, you know, as was well said by Pastor Jerome, you know, submitting to the government don't mean like blind and, you know, submission. You always have to go back to the word of God. And we have to be mindful as we live life in terms of what we submit. Some things might be silent. It might be, it might act in terms of, you know, slight and, you know, not, and, but, but it's progressive. But through prayer and through the study of God's word, we, have to, we will know when we have to take a stand and not to submit. Because um, as a church, we believe in certain, you know, doctrine, um, mark of the beast and all these things. But we have to know in light of by prayerfully when we have to take, take, um, take our stand. Because some things might, might, might seem on, on, on the surface, but it could have a deeper underlying effect. I want to just pump, um, permit me to just quickly um, read um, 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 three verses, um, I, I believe, in terms of, you know, in, in the idea of submitting to authority. There was an issue in, in the book of Acts, you know, with um, some of the apostles, well, the disciples and stuff, apostles, you know, with Peter and, and they had a, a conflict in, in, in terms of the, the, the idea of boys submitting. And it's, it says in Acts chapter, chapter uh, 5, and reading from verse 25, he said, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom he put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. They hold them, they say, Look, you know, you have to submit. You have to, you cannot preach the word of God. You have to submit to us. We're saying, Don't do it. But we have seen in verse 28 say, saying, Did not, then they went to them and they're saying, Did not we, you know, um, strictly command you? That he should not teach in his in his in this name, and behold, he has filled um, Jer Jerusalem with a doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. This is the by Christ. But the apostles know they know that what they're doing is right, is right, and they cannot submit submit to the authority of the day or the, go or the government in not proclaiming the gospel. And, and my last two verse, um, um, please permit me. My last two verse, um, forty and verse forty two. It says here, and to him. They agreed, and when they called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They hold them, they beat them, and they say, hello, submit, stop. 
but verse 42 say, and daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So here we see the scenario um, with Peter and stuff and, and how they were being persec persec persecuted and told, hello, submit to us, don't preach Christ, don't preach in his name, stop. What they do? They did not stop because it was to proclaim the, the gospel of Christ. Amen. And, uh, Madam, yes. Madam, Madam yes. Mr. Moderator, I want to add that the fact that God ordained the government, as Paul says, it, does, it must not be taken to mean that God supports the evil that the government does. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. And again, that's an that's a, that's a important point to mm -hmm. make. True. Even as was shared, um, you have Carol Martin um, expressing that. Give unto Caesar what is due to Caesar according as per Christ. We must be able to stand up against the laws when it goes against the law of God. And of course, Brendan Wells says, um, Amen. Of course, we see um, Brother Hamish Daniel online also saying hello. I'm happy to have you, Hamish, and uh, God continue to bless you. Um, even as we consider, um, we have a, um, one more question, and it's such an important question that, you know, we have to give it some time. So I'm going to take my time in, in, um, in, in sharing that question, give um, due response to the question, but it has to really um, do with, um, according to Matthew 5.17, um, which law did Jesus come to fulfill? Was it the law of the land or the law of God? And of course, that question also in extension uh, covers, um, can you comment on the statement that the laws of God has been abolished? Is that biblical? And of course, the scripture reference is Colossians 2 and verse 14. All right, so these two scriptures, and of course, you can take note of it, uh, Matthew 5, 17, when we talk about Jesus coming to fulfill the law, was it the law of the land or the law of God? And Colossians 2.14, um, as it relates to the laws of God being abolished, is that biblical? And of course, that will help summarize our discussion today, even as it relates to the laws of the land versus the law of God. Because there are many out there who is purporting that the very presence of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, was to abolish the law. And if such, if God's law is abolished, then all that remains is the law of man. I mean, if we have to take the sequence in terms of that. So let's examine those passages of Scripture in depth. And of course, as I said, our panelists have been doing a very um, wonderful, a great job in answering thus far. And so our final question for the day, um, did Jesus come to fulfill the law? Was it um, the law of the land or the law of God? And the second part of that is, has the law of God been abolished? Um, is it biblical? Please explain. So we're going to give Pastor Gordon to begin, and of course, Pastor Palmer will share after he's through. Um, Mr. Moderator, um, that's a very interesting question. Did Christ fulfill the law? And the, of course, the answer to that is yes, Christ fulfilled the law. And then the, the, the corollary question would therefore be, which law did he fulfill? And if we may take it further, Having fulfilled the law, what, what does that mean? So let's take it one at a time. Did Christ fulfill the, the law? Yes, he fulfilled the ceremonial law. Paul tells us that Christ is our Passover lamb. So having come, we no longer need to take a lamb and, um, and you know, do the sacrificial stuff or take turtle doves or find flour mixed with oil and the whole Levitical prescription that we know. Christ fulfilled all of that in that it all pointed to him, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, Christ fulfilled the law. And so all the ceremonies that pointed to his atoning death, his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross, all of those came to an end when Jesus died. So, yes, he fulfilled the ceremonial law. Now, the, the question is, having fulfilled the ceremonial law, what next? It means that we trust him for salvation and we don't need to kill lambs anymore. But then did he fulfill the, 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 the moral law, what we like to call the Ten Commandments? And the answer to that is yes. And the question is how? He fulfilled the law by showing us how to keep it. In Christ, we have the perfect example of what it means to obey the Ten Commandments. So... It means that from now on, we have no excuse. 
we don't have to break the, the seventh commandment by committing adultery because Christ lived that life and has the power to give us to be obedient to God's commandments. We don't have to lie, um, the, the, the ninth commandment, because we see it in the life of Christ. And we can live like Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So he fulfilled both laws, the ceremonial law in that we no longer have to do the Levitical prescriptions, and he fulfilled the moral law in that he has now shown us how to keep it and has promised to give us the power to always keep the Ten Commandments. Amen. A very powerful thought indeed, so that Christ himself empowers us even to obey his law. And so when Jesus saved you, you are completely saved, mm -hmm. even through his power. Sure. So Pastor Palmer, um, your response um, to the question. To add something, and speaking about the, the law, because we have two texts in fulfill, fulfilling, and then the one in um, Colossians um, chapter 2, um, I'm taking it um, from verse um, 14. Sure. Um, so we, we, we have it there. Um, and we are saved. Well, to, to just read, you know, Colossians 2 and verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was um, contrary to us, and, and, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the, to, the, to the cross. Well, Pastor Jerome, you know, did a good, um, give a good explanation. Fulfill, you know, he speaks about, you know, to, in terms of God's, God's will being done in terms of obedience. Obedience, because we're speaking about the law of God, the law of man. You know, the fulfillment comes in in terms of obedience. And, and, and the law of God, right, the Ten Commandments, the testimony, the moral law, the law of love, right? And then we have also the law of Moses, the book of the law, the book of the covenant, the ceremonial laws and stuff, as speaking in the book of um, Colossians. But that, to us, um, as was said, fulfilled. But there's, there's something important there that the ceremonial laws fulfill. Christ came, that end. But in terms of the continuity of, of the law of God, that fulfill and continue. So it shows that God does not change. God, people change. God does not change. The ceremonial aspect of it and other laws um, was fulfilled in Christ. It ended. The cross, you know, ending. But in light of the law of God, that divine law, the Ten Commandments, remains in continuity to us even this day. And that is what we have to obey as a people, the law of God. And I may I understand. add, if I may add, Mr. Moderator, I think the key phrase, the phrase that unlocks the meaning of Colossians 2.14 is the phrase that says, which are shadows of things to come, mm -hmm. right? So that which was nailed to the cross was what constitutes the shadows of things to come. Now, when we take the Sabbath, for example, what we find out is that the Sabbath was from creation. All the Levitical systems, all the ceremonies, all the types and shadows came after sin, and those pointed to the salvation plan in types and shadows. But the Sabbath, for example, was before sin and therefore could not be a type because types only came into being after sin. The Sabbath is perpetual. It's from creation and it continues right through the ages. As Pastor Palmer said, the, it's, it's perpetual. So when you want to unlock that, that, that phrase, ask yourself, ask, unlike the text, I'm sorry, ask yourself, what does it mean, shadows of things to come? Only the things that were types and shadows, those are the only ones that ended at the cross. But everything else, God's ten moral principles, the ten commandments, they continue. As long as there is life on the earth, you're going to be hearing from Jesus, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. There will never be a time when this will be obviated, rescinded, or cancelled. It will always be in operation because they are eternal moral principles and we can obey through the power of God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, thank you so much. I see we have a question. Um, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Uh, Pastor Palmer, just as he starts in reading, um, we made reference to Matthew 5 verse 17. Jesus came to fulfill the law. And I know that we would have touched it a little, but um, since the question has been asked directly, um, we're going to read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19 
and um, I seek to bring clarity um, to that aspect of it. Well, the, the Word of God declares Matthew 5 and verse 19. It says here, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Wonderful. So again, it, it just highlights the point um, that our panelists um, would have been echoing um, throughout the program that God's law does not change. Um, God, as he says, is easy for heaven and earth to pass. Um, easier for that to happen than from one little dot, a little dash from the word be removed. And so those who are, are preaching that God's law is done away with, the Bible is saying that those who remove, uh, remove from the word of God, that definitely that they will have to face the judgment of God. Those who are honorable are those who are obedient to the word and teach men to be obedient um, to the laws of God. And so, yes, we are in a very interesting age, and, and so many things are being taught that is contrary to the law of God. But I think that even as we consider the word today, it is clear that God's law is unchangeable. And so we could build upon him the law of man. And of course, because in our Western world, we have the kind of Judeo-Christian um, basis for our legal system, that it is basically built around the Ten Commandments. But what we have seen, even in, in, in the general living and in the social aspect of things, that there are a number of it, and, and we would have made hint to a number of them, even as related to sexuality and a number of those things, that man them, uh, men themselves have sought to engage in behavior that is contrary to the will of God. But at the same time, they have enacted laws to protect evil behavior. But God says that it's better to obey him than to obey man. And so even as we summarize uh, um, our discussion today, um, one of the things that we must um, take note of is that when we consider the law of God, it does not only inform our morality, that is to say, what is right and wrong, but remember that the law of God is also just. The law of God is just. In other words, God is, is a just God. And so when you obey the law of God, you reap the rewards of being obedient. The laws of men, they are not always just. And therefore, the Christian, even our panelists would have indicated, there are times when we have to stand up for what is right. And standing up for what is right sometimes means that in the eyes of man, we might be um, rebellious in that sense, but in the eyes of God, we are obedient. And so it's important that we make that clear distinction and realize that we have to obey God rather than man. So I'll give the panelists um, a, 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 a half a second, a minute or so, um, to summarize and even to share their final thoughts. And then we're going to uh, conclude with prayer. And so we're going to allow the panelists to give their concluding thoughts, and then we're going to summarize and have a word of prayer. Pastor well, Palmer. Well, as we have discussed, law of God, law of man. And we have said earlier that, you know, man trying, all laws well, of the land, you know, is trying to pattern offer the law of God. Uh, it shows our sinfulness in terms of sometimes the law come forth where it become unjust and it become, you know, causing issues. But when the law of God stand, it is fair, is is it, is just, you know, it, it is binding on us to help us to, to grow, you know, to, to develop. And of course, it speaks about sal um, sal um, salvation. The law of the land, you know, dealing with terms of our behavior and so but 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 God's law points to the salvation. And 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 being said that we as Christians have to know what the Bible is about and take a stand. And when we see, you know, we see as all the Bible examples, when we see things on are contrary to the word of God, we can't be silent. We can't just sit back there and allow things to, to just go its own way. We have to, by God's grace, um, take our stand and, and make it be known that we ought to follow the, the, the word of God as was shown by the apostles and others. We have to, ought to follow the word of God um, in our lifestyle. And of course, whenever there is a the contravening the law of, 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 of the law of the land contravenes the law of God, we cannot follow the law of the land. Our, our mandate, our obedience, is to the law of God. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Palmer. Pastor Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. There are consequences that one has to face 
when you take a stand. And whenever there is a conflict between the law of God and the law of man, the consequences that you face are inexorable and inescapable, unavoidable. So if you disobey God, there are consequences. And if you obey God and disobey man, there are consequences. You never get rid of the consequences. So it means that as we go forward, we cannot be pusillanimous and, and, um, and, and we cannot be cowards. We have to make a non-negotiable commitment to God that it doesn't matter what comes. And Revelation 13 speaks about a time when there will be a power that will pass religious laws contrary to the law of God, especially the fourth commandment. But we need to understand that as we take a stand, we may not be able to enjoy some conveniences, but we will have the blessings of God. So respect the law of the land, but prepare yourself that whatever consequences come when you stand up for the Lord, be it a lion's den or a fiery furnace, you will have the power and blessings of God on your side. Amen. Powerful indeed. So we thank the panelists um, for sharing today. Um, they have been excellent um, in um, examining and analyzing um, the subject before us. And again, I see the responses would have been in agreement. Um, never, never change. Thank God. God would stand forever. It never fails. Um, only the fourth commandment to them is really done away with. All the other seems binding and okay with them. And of course, that summarizes uh, uh, in terms of the outlook of what persons have in these last days. You know, what is convenient to man, they embrace it. What they consider to be inconvenient, they hate it. But what we have to do, as the panelists would have echoed, is to stay true to God, stay true to his word. He never changes. There is no shadow of turning in him. And as we are obedient to his will, he says that we will indeed eat of the good of the land. So the laws of God will stand forever, but the kingdom of man and the kingdom of this world will be judged and will be destroyed. So be obedient to God, trust him, build upon his word, and he will keep his people. So at this time, as we come to a close, of Pastor's Corner for this week, we want to invite you to tune in next week. And of course, we're going to meet again as we discuss the topics as that are relevant to us and of course will indeed edify and build our faith. Of course, the program will be rebroadcast later and we're going looking forward to having those who maybe have, didn't have an opportunity to join us live to be part of this wonderful program. So at this time, we want to invite our Pastor um, Gordon to pray as we close the program for today. Let's pray. Our gracious, wonderful Father, what a joy it is for us to call you Father. You are a responsible Father, not an absentee Father. You love us and you care for us. I pray, Lord, that in these challenging days of Earth's history, that you will fortify our minds with your truth. You will give us the strength to stand up for you. And even when the consequences are terrible, that we will know that as long as we are on God's side, we shall receive the blessing and indeed the blessings of eternal life. Bless us now. Thank you for our wonderful listeners and viewers who have shared these moments with us. Thank you for my colleague panelist and our moderator. And may your hand be upon us and take us through the rest of our day and the rest of our lives. We humbly pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, viewers. And may God bless us richly until we see him face to face. God bless you. And let us keep obedient to God's will.